I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in our seminar today. It's lovely to see you all walk in, take a seat and relax because today we have an awesome uh, Geoscience Australia Distinguished Lecturer, Anthony Schofield. And it's a real honour to introduce today's lecture. And on this special occasion, I'd like to award our lecturer this small gift in recognition of this huge achievement. Oh, th thank, thank you, Marina. <laughs> it's my pleasure, <laughs> Anthony. This week, our seminar is entitled Data Integration for Greenfields Exploration, Uncovering New Exploration Frontiers in Northern Australia. Another in our Distinguished Geoscience Australia Lecture Series, and of course, today is Anthony Schofield. Anthony joined Geoscience Australia in 2007 after completing his undergraduate degree at the University of Melbourne. He has worked on a range of products, in particular regional stratigraphic drilling programs, and most recently, Anthony has been the activity leader for under, undercover geology and stratigraphic drilling and is currently leading a project examining the basement geology and resource potential of the covered East Tennant region in Northern Territory. Please welcome Anthony. Thank you very much for that introduction, Marina. Um, just before I begin, I just want to, oh, here we go. There we go. Um, I just want to acknowledge that bits of work like this are rarely the product of one person or even really necessarily a handful of people. And this bit of work's no different. So before I start, I want to acknowledge a huge number of contributors from uh, across Geoscience Australia, but also the Northern Territory Geological Survey and the MINEX CRC. And without uh, a lot of these people or all of these people, this presentation just wouldn't be possible. So to begin with, I want to uh, go back in time, way back, all the way back to 2007. And because uh, it's so long ago, uh, I just want to remind you of some of the things that happened. So uh, the Geelong Cats won the AFL Premiership, which is um, regrettable. But uh, in other news, the first iPhone was announced and it looks like a little baby iPhone compared to what you get today. Um, Kevin 07 was a thing. And in popular culture, the top movie in Australia was one of the Harry Potters, which is um, not surprising given how many there are. It's statistically, it had to be sooner or later. And the number one album in Australia was by Michael Bublé, demonstrating that at one point he didn't just come out at Christmas time. But like Marina said in her introduction, 2007 also saw the year that I joined Geoscience Australia. And this is a photo of me on my first day on the job. It's the photo that's on my pass. You can tell it's the first day because I'm, I'm wearing a tie in it. And when I joined GA, I was uh, I joined the Onshore Energy and Minerals Division, which is um, the division at the time. And at that time, the division had a strategic goal, which was to contribute directly to the discovery of a new energy or mineral province. And I remember thinking, and you know, maybe I was just young and naive at the time, but I remember thinking to myself, well, that sounds great, but how the hell do you actually do that? And if I'm being completely honest, um, I didn't know how it could be done. I didn't even know if it could be done. Um, so it's quite an audacious challenge. Uh, but why? Why do we need to discover new mineral provinces? And it's really a question of supply and demand, but we're going to look at the demand side of things first. So this graph here shows a compilation of the global production of copper, uh, which is an important commodity to fuel modern day life. And on this, this graph, the darker blue colours show the amount of copper which has been produced um, to date or up until current as, as of uh, really recently, since the dawn of time. And the lighter blue colours are the forecast demand for copper. And the takeaway point from all this, and there's a lot of things in there, but the takeaway point is in the relatively near term future, assuming that demand continues at a similar rate, we're going to, we're going to need uh, the same or more copper than what's been mined up until this point in history, which is just um, crazy to think about. So it's a huge demand and it's clear that we need to find more. Uh, and to fuel that demand, we need to mine it. Um, we can recycle some, but we need to uh, produce new copper as well. So this graph here shows the amount of copper which has been discovered globally since you know 1900. 
And again, if we look at those darker colours, they're representing the, the bigger deposits. So ones that contain quite a lot of copper in them. Things like, you know, some of the big porphyry copper deposits, Olympic dams, stuff like that. And the takeaway point from all this is that a lot of our copper resources actually come from the discovery of these really big supergiant deposits. And we haven't found one of those for quite a while. In fact, we haven't found one in the last 25 years. So again, it's clear that we need to find more and also not just more, but bigger deposits. These giant deposits are largely, uh, you know, I mean, we were talking about copper before, but the kind of giant deposits that, um, that we think about are things like Mount Isa, Broken Hill, like I said, Olympic Dam. Um, and a ton of these were found way back in the day by old timey prospectors. And by and large, they were found because they stick out of the ground at the Earth's surface. But today, it's unlikely that many or, or really um, possibly any of these are still actually to be found at the surface. And to find the next large deposits, we need to go undercover. The problem is that a lot of Australia actually is a little bit like this. So this is a, a photo that I took of the Barclay Tablelands in the Northern Territory. And if you've been there, um, you know what it's like. Uh, there's not a single rock in sight. The rocks um, which have the potential to host mineralization are obscured beneath more recent sediments, um, this kind of stuff, which means that we can't just go over and kick over a rock and find a giant deposit. So mineral exploration is often likened to searching for a needle in a haystack. And maybe, um, maybe we would be more successful if the needles were the same uh, ratio of size to, to haystack as shown in this picture. But anyway, so it's like finding a needle in a haystack, but for future discoveries, what we actually need to find in the first place is the haystacks themselves to search for the needle in. But even more fundamentally, we need to know if we're in the right kind of field. So just like you've been unlikely to find hay in a fruit orchard, for example, you'd be wasting your time looking in, in an, the kind of area where you don't have the right geological ingredients to form an ore deposit. So before we get seriously searching, we need to find that we're in the right ballpark, the right kind of field, that we, we have the right kind of ingredients coming together to form a mineral deposit. So how have we gone about looking for things to date? Well, this graph shows a, a global compilation of the exploration methods, which have been primarily used to select tenements at a project scale. So around about 50 by 50 um, kilometer in size box um, that have ultimately then led to a discovery being made. And a cursory glance at this graph reveals a few unsettling uh, things which are gonna cause a lot of challenges for us. So firstly, Early discoveries um, and including, you know, some of those big deposits that we know and love and mine still today um, were made by prospecting. Um, so, you know, old timey prospectors doing basic work uh, to, to try and find mineralization. And the techniques are primitive, but it's hard to argue with its effectiveness so long as you have rocks that are, occur at or very close to the Earth's surface. Uh, the second thing to note is that there's an overall trend over time which shows that most discoveries occur as a, as a result of searching from close by to where we know things already are. And again, that's fine so long as you're looking near where you know you have known deposits. But it starts to become a problem if we're on the hunt for completely new mineralized areas. So clearly, if we're going to expand into new areas, greenfield areas that are covered where we don't have known deposits, we need a better approach. Now, if you tuned in a few weeks ago to the, the Wednesday presentation, um, uh, my colleague, Carl Charnota, presented a DGAL on how the key in, a key interface at the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary could be used as a kind of treasure map. Uh, and using that, we could find new, previously unknown deposits. Well, um, today, we're going to be looking at the same challenge, but instead of using a treasure map, uh, what we're gonna be using is something more like a blender. And, the key to this approach is we're gonna take a whole bunch of ingredients, we're gonna chuck them in, we're gonna combine them, and hopefully what we whiz up is something better than what the sum of the parts is. So the way that we've done this is through the Exploring for the Future program, or EFTF for short. 
Um, EFTFs really at the pointy end of a process of thinking about how we can predictively map out potential for new mineral resources. And it's sort of, it's grown out of a number of previous uh, programs that GAs had and that state surveys have had. So it's really a kind of, um, you know, one of these magic points in time where we've learned a lot of lessons and now we're ready to start applying them. So for those who might not be, be familiar, EFTF was a uh, phase one of EFTF was a four-year program, which went from 2016 to earlier this year. Um, it was worth $100 million, which is quite a large amount of money. And it was really focused around trying to understand what the resource potential is for mineral, minerals, energy, and groundwater resources across Northern Australia. So the area shown in the, um, in the, in, in through here. Um, there was a number of activities that took place as part of Exploring for the Future, really big data acquisition campaigns and interpretation and things like that. Some of those took place at a Northern Australia wide scale. Um, so, you know, things that were rolled out all across this area, you know, big operations. And then there was uh, these things called focused integrated studies. And these were um, more regionally focused programs where we could really dive pretty deep into the geology and um, the data and try and understand what it all means for resource potential. And one of those areas was this one in through this region here, the Tennant Creek to Mount Isa area, which goes from, funnily enough, Tennant Creek in the Northern Territory across the Queensland border to Mount Isa. And one of the goals of this, uh, of the, of the Tennant Creek to Mount Isa project was to identify a juicy looking area that we could then follow up with targeted data, uh, targeted data acquisition, especially leading to regional stratigraphic drilling. And hopefully through that process, fulfill that vision um, from the division from when I first joined Geoscience Australia and recognize a new mineral province undercover. So this map here shows the geology which is exposed at the surface for the area between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa. So the darker colours on this map, um, things in through here and, and here around Tennant Creek, uh, where we have older basement rocks exposed at the surface. And the young, uh, the, the lighter colours represent more recent cover rocks, you know, this, this kind of area, this kind of stuff. The small coloured dots, which you can see around here and here and places like that, are where we have known mineral deposits. And what's immediately obvious is that there's a very close spatial correlation with, between those known mineral deposits and where you have those basement rocks exposed at surface. But I want you to note this vast area in the middle where we have no known mineral occurrences, uh, no known deposits. And this is an area where more recent basins, in this case, the Georgina Basin and, and some younger stacked basins, obscure potentially prospective basement rocks. And as such, it's an area where very little mineral exploration has taken place. So the approach taken in the Tennant Creek to Mount Isa region was to acquire a huge amount of data sets um, all the way from the Earth's surface down through the basins and the cover, the crust, right down into the mantle um, to try and comprehensively map the Earth's composition, its age, various other parameters and aspects, um, all the way through the lithosphere. So trying to really characterise it and to use that to inform how we understand the geology and the mineral potential of the area. Um, uh, I'm during, sorry, during this presentation, I'm going to be talking about a number of these uh, data sets. And because I'm going to be covering a lot of ground, I'm not going to be able to get into a lot of the, the detail about them, um, which is a bit of a shame because there's some really great detail there. Instead, I'm going to be painting a fairly broad picture and so rather than specifics, we're gonna be looking at patterns that emerge uh, rather than those specific details. But the good news is that uh, recently, as, um, as part of the delivery of the Exploring for the Future program, that an extended abstracts volume has been produced. Um, and the link is up there on screen. And that contains a lot more information about these really cool data sets and cool techniques which have been applied as part of EFTF. So if you're interested, uh, please go and take a look at that. It's, it's really good. So in order to go about trying to identify where you might have a new mineral province undercover in the Tannin Creek to Mount Isa region, we're going to follow this three-step process. So step one of this process is to identify a fairway. 
The second step is to reduce the scale. So go from broad to something um, more defined. And the third step is to use real rocks to make a real difference. And we'll be going through these. And as we do, we'll be gradually looking at finer and finer detail. And we'll be using a whole range of different data sets to do that. So let's begin with step one, identifying the fairway. So people aren't randomly and evenly distributed across the face of the earth. They're concentrated in a number of, in, in certain places due to things like climate, uh, landscapes, where you can get coffee, that kind of thing. And just like people, there's certain geological features which make it more likely to find a mineral deposit in some places relative to other places. And one of the biggest controls on these locations is favourable architecture. And by this, what I really mean are the big geological building blocks and the features which make up the present day Earth. Now, this map that I've shown here um, is uh, a map of faults. So faults older than the Proterozoic age, which have been mapped from a solid geology interpretation of this area, which was produced as part of EFTF. And that's overlaying on an image uh, which combines gravity and magnetics. Um, faults are a really important part of the architecture because they provide the pathway uh, for the transport of metals and fluids from their source regions right up to depositional sites um, that we can explore for and discover in the near surface. So there's a lot of um, a lot of detail there, so many faults. But what we can do is to simplify this map somewhat to show only those really, really big faults that we can recognize using uh, predominantly magnetics and gravity uh, geophysical data sets. These faults are significant structures. They've got strike lengths of, of several hundred kilometers once you start connecting them up. And that's just the kind of architecture which we want for localizing a mineral deposit. So that's great. Um, but if we just use magnetics and gravity data alone, we're not really able to provide insights into a number of things we want to understand about these. So we don't know much about their nature. Um, we don't know how significant they are or how deeply they penetrate into the earth. And to do that, we need um, different data sets to give us different uh, perspectives on them. A tantalizing clue into whether there were really big faults in the area came from a series of passive, tra passive seismic traverses in the region, which were actually put out um, uh, prior to Exploring for the Future by um, Christian Sippel. So passive seismic is a data set which we can use to map the geology beneath cover. Um, the technique involves deploying some seismometers that then measure ambient noise from things like earthquakes, and then they can take these ambient noise signals and use them to map the seismic velocity of the rocks beneath, which we can then start to relate to geology and structures and, and things like that. Uh, the locations of these passive seismic uh, stations were uh, shown here in these, in these light green dots. So um, it does extend further down here, but I'm just not showing it. Using the data from this, uh, this survey, a transect of seismic velocity uh, was generated and it's published. So this is, this is the, um, the transect through here. And what it, what it shows is in this area here, there's an offset in the base of the crust at, at um, an interface called the Moho of around about 10 kilometers. And this is suggesting there's the presence of a major structure there, which is um, big enough to have influenced um, the whole crust. So very significant structure south of Tennant Creek. And given its relationship uh, or its close proximity to Tennant Creek, which we know is mineralized, it's a it's a current mining province. Um, the the logical question that falls out of it is: Does this structure have any relationship to that known mineralization in Tennant Creek? Does it have some? Did it exert some kind of control on it? And I guess even more importantly for what we're trying to do here, do we have evidence for a similar major structure elsewhere in this Tennant Creek to Mount Isa area? So as part of Exploring for the Future, we decided to get our very own passive seismic data. And we did that as part of um, something called the Osiray project. Uh, instead of using transects like we showed before, Osiray uses a grid um, of seismometers to map out variations in seismic velocity spatially. So the map that's shown here shows seismic velocity at around about a depth slice of uh, 10 to 12 kilometers in the earth. So corresponding roughly to mid crustal depth. So the warm colors in this map are um, slower seismic velocities, the cooler colors are faster velocities. And there's a whole lot of detail in there again, 
But what I want you to note are these east-northeast trending bands, um, which correspond really closely to both the trend and in some cases the locations of where we had mapped in these major faults using magnetics and gravity data. And what these data are showing is that the faults that are imaged in the near surface have, or, or, or those trends have expressions of larger, more fundamental architecture, which is present in the mid to upper crust. So we're starting to understand a bit more about the significance um, of those, of those uh, faults. We can go even deeper using seismic velocity data sets right down to the very base of the Earth's tectonic plates. So the contours on this map show the depth to the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. And if you watch Carol's presentation the other week, you'll be familiar with this. But if not, uh, the important thing to know is that it's a very significant interface in the Earth and variations in the thickness of the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary can have important implications for where a mineral deposit may form. Uh, again, there's all sorts of uh, useful information in this. There's, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. But in particular, what draws my eye and what I'd like to draw your attention to is this major gradient where you go from you know, roughly 215 kilometers um, depth of lithosphere, asthenosphere boundary across to, you know, 100, 180, 175 kind of kilometers depth. So you've got around about 40 kilometers of vertical, off, uh, vertical offset along that surface across 150 kilometers of lateral distance. Now, that's a very significant gradient. It's a very big fundamental edge, and it's, and it's the kind of thing that is potentially quite useful for localizing where you've got mineralizing processes. And again, you know, if we have a look at the position of this uh, gradient, it's very similar uh, spatially with the different data sets that we've been looking at so far. So if we put all these different lines of evidence together, we can map really for the first time this east-northeast trending corridor through here, where we have structures with an expression all the way from the surface right down to the base of the lithosphere. And these are the exact kind of kinds of favorable architecture, which have been recognized to be associated with large mineral systems globally. So using these data, we're on the right track, I think. Our thinking was further strengthened by another one of the deep imaging data sets, which has been acquired in this area as part of Exploring for the Future. Uh, this time we're looking at OSLAMP long period magnetic lyrics data. And this data set uses a different parameter to map out variations in the composition of the Earth. Like I said, it's another one of these deep, fuzzy imaging data sets. Um, but this time, instead of using seismic velocity, we're mapping variations in the electrical resistivity. And I guess um, uh, it's mapping resistivity, but what, we're, what uh, a lot of us talk about is conductivity, So, uh, which is just the inverse of it. So in this map, uh, we, we're showing in effect, the conductivity of the Earth. So the warmer colors, again, are more conductive zones and the blue are more resistive. And there's a number of depth slices that we can take through this model. And I've just shown one here, which is from 35 kilometers depth in the Earth. So roughly looking at the lower crust. Um, and again, I've overlaid some of the layers we've been looking at previously, but I just want to point, bring your attention to this again, east northeast trending zone where we have elevated electrical conductivity stretching from just east of Tennant Creek all the way across to the Queensland border. And the trend and position of this feature is almost identical to the structural corridor we were looking at previously. It seems that there is some kind of um, relationship there, which is great. It's another data set that's sort of confirming our thinking this is a major architectural corridor. Like I said, we can take a number of depth slices through, through these magnetic models. And here I've shown another one, which is from 60 kilometers depth. So now we're, we've gone from being in the crust to being within the mantle. And there's a very similar picture emerging. But instead of just showing architecture and where there's structures, um, what we're now looking at is variation in the composition of the mantle. And what this potentially represents is a more fertile source region where the mantle's been metasomatized or, or hydrothermally altered. And again, these zones are more favorable for the formation of large mineral systems. So putting all these broad data sets together, there's a clear front runner emerging in the Tennant Creek to Mount Isa region to focus on going work on, which is this 
area, which is shown in these, these dashed lines here, which is the East Tenant Corridor. Like we've said, this is a major structural corridor where we have expressions of it from the base of the plate at the lithosphere of boundary right up to the near surface. It's that major lithospheric edge, that gradient, which is really significant. And we have conductivity in the Earth's, conductivity variations in the Earth's crust and mantle, which suggests that it's potentially a more juicy zone. So um, it's looking really good. So at this stage, I think we can tick. We've identified a potentially prospective fairway in the area using these fuzzy broad data sets. So like I said, we've, we've identified pathways or potential pathways, we've identified fertile source regions, but so far these data sets really are deep and fuzzy. You know, we've been looking at 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers depth in the earth, even deeper going into the mantle. And, you know, for those mineral explorers in the audience, you know it's not, <laughs> you know, you're not gonna be able to drill a hole down to that depth. So what we need to do is to reduce the scale. We need to connect up um, those deep features with something more in the near surface that's accessible to exploration. We need to go from the broad to a, a finer scale. And importantly, we've been looking at a lot of these geophysical data sets. We need to connect these with the geology to see how the geophysical objects are expressed geologically. So that brings us to step two reducing the scale. So to assist in reducing the scale, once we'd identified the East Tenant Corridor, we undertook a couple of higher resolution in-field geophysical data acquisition campaigns to try and resolve um, some of these features of interest. So we did two different data acquisition activities. Uh, we did um, gravity infill so the the station spacing out here was four kilometers we infilled that to two kilometers and that was so that we could better map out the geology under cover and um, the area of that gravity survey is shown here in this light green uh, box here and i'm not going to be talking about that data but it is quite amazing the amount of extra information you can suck out of it when you start going down um, to a higher resolution of gravity data. And so that data is now released, it's available online. I strongly encourage you to, um, to make the most of that. Um, but like I said, I'm not gonna touch on it today. What I am gonna talk a little bit about more is the infill magnetolurics that we did. So before we were talking about um, OSLAMP long period magnetolurics, what we did was to conduct a um, more closely spaced uh, survey which used uh, related but slightly different magnetolurics techniques. So in this case, broadband MT and audio MT. And these uh, these different magnetolurics techniques are able to image shallower depths in the Earth's crust at a, at a finer resolution. And we did this to connect up uh, the conductors we saw in the OSLAMP data with things in the near surface. And also there's some things you can do with audio MT around cover thickness modeling. And um, I'm not gonna talk about that, but again, it's really cool. And there's been some information recently put out on that. So this is the East Tenant Magnetolurics Survey. So uh, on the base map here, I've got that OSLAMP section from 35 kilometers depth. So again, this is the conductor we were interested in. And what we did was, was plan a survey with a number of traverses, um, three main traverses with the, uh, with the station shown in these, um, these white dots here with a few infill stations, which went across that MT conductor to try and get a better picture of what was going on with that. So we're gonna have a look at one of the transects through this data, which is shown in this black line here. So this is, this is the transect, and this is the picture that we had from the OSLAMP data. So uh, this conductor down here, this red blob, is what we saw in the OSLAMP data at depth, which was originally so interesting to us. And this is the extra information which has come out as a result of this survey. And I remember, um, uh, one of the geophysicists here who acquired this data set, you know, she she called me over to our desk and said, oh, you know, I've done some preliminary modeling and I went over and I'm like, oh, yes, we've done it. Amazing. It's always worth doing an MT survey uh, just as a early takeaway point. But the amount of de extra detail we get out of this survey is phenomenal. So 
We've got our deep OSLAM conductor through here. What we see is a number of discrete pathways which connect that feature down in the, the mid to lower crust with conductors that we can see in the near surface, which I've um, just highlighted there. Like I said, we want to connect up what we see in the geophysics with geology. So when we have a look at where uh, these conductors reach the surface and compare that to our map of the structures we were looking at earlier, we can see that where they come up to the surface corresponds one-to-one -one with where we've got these major faults. And you can see these pathways which come up um, continuously from depth. And so I think the interpretation uh, that makes sense from all this is that we have evidence for some kind of um, uh, control on the conductivity structure from these structures and our interpretation of that would be that it's evidence for crustal scale fluid flow. Again, that's potentially representing a massive flux of fluids and hydrothermal alteration throughout the Earth's crust and it's the kind of thing that you would be looking for if you're trying to find a large ore deposit in this area. Uh, I guess at this point I, I risk sounding a little bit like uh, an infomercial salesman, but uh, there is more. It's not steak knives, but in this case it's another conductivity data set. So, so far we've been using different kinds of magnetic lyrics, which we've used to map conductivity all the way from the mantle to the upper crust. But there is another geophysical technique which we can use to map the conductivity structure right in the upper few hundred metres of the Earth's surface, um, which are more ac accessible to uh, mineral exploration. And that technique is airborne electromagnetics. Um, so as part of Exploring for the Future program, we rolled out this uh, massive scale airborne EM uh, data acquisition campaign called AusAEM. And there's, there's some really cool images and there's some cool data that's come out from that and it's a phenomenal data set. Um, but this data has been collected by, uh, instead of deploying stations, it's a plane which conducts a series of flight lines and those are shown in this, um, in this map here in these uh, kind of brownish lines. And it just so happens that one of these lines passes right over the top of one of the MT conductors that we've been looking at, this one over here. Um, and what we can see from the airborne EM data is right where we have the broadband MT conductor, we also have a discrete near surface conductor. And this is, you know, this is a kind of like drill me kind of target that you would be looking for in mineral exploration. Um, and it's really great to see, you know, we've gone through this process, we've been mapping the mantle, we followed up through the crust, now we have something right very close to the Earth's surface. It's, it's pretty amazing. And it all sounds a little bit too good to be true. Um, like I said, it started as a fuzzy blob, and now we can resolve it up into something actually targetable by mineral explorers. And this is the exact kind of location where you might want to then start your search for the distal footprints or the expressions of an ore deposit. One of the mineral deposits we're interested in mapping the potential for in these tenant area is iron oxide, oxide copper gold or ICG deposits. And as the name implies, these deposits have a lot of iron oxides associated with them. Uh, the good news about that is that for us is that these iron oxides have characteristics which let us model where they might occur using magnetics and gravity data. So magnetite, you know, as the name suggests, it's magnetic, but it's also quite dense, uh, whereas hematite is non-magnetic and also dense. So we can interrogate the, the, um, the geophysical properties of this area to try and map out those zones of alteration where you have these minerals. So the map on the right here shows the locations where we've modeled uh, this kind of alteration. So in this map, areas of hematite are red and magnetite are gray. And there's a lot of air, uh, a lot of this kind of modeled alteration in the area. A number of these are likely to be um, from lithological controls, but some of them might actually be representing hydrothermal alteration. And so it's really pleasing to see a number of these, um, these blobs emerge. Even more pleasing, you have areas where you have uh, hematite magnetite, sorry, hematite rich alteration adjacent to magnetite rich alteration. And this is important because this is an important um, redox gradient where you can have metals that get precipitated out of ore bearing solutions. So it's important for deposition of metals. And across this region, you can see a number of examples of that. You can see it through here, in here, in here. And also, pleasingly, you can see it 
in this area where we had, um, you know, where we had these conductors coming up to the near surface, we could resolve them with the airborne EM data. So it's looking good. We have a number of layers stacking up. Fortunately, uh, there's been some historic mineral exploration in this area, but uh, not a lot. And one historic mineral exploration drill hole, this DDH005, goes right into this area, which has been of such interest to us and where we've had a number of these data sets starting to line up. And we went and had a look at the drill core from this, this hole. It sits in Alice Springs. You too can go there and have a look. Um, and this is what we saw in those rocks. So what we have is iron oxide alteration. Um, so in this case, it's a, it's a meta sediment and it has uh, extensive magnetite alteration overprinted by hematite alteration, exactly the kind of thing which we were um, predicting we'd see from this modeling of, of ICG type alteration. And included with that alteration was a bit of minor copper. So I think this is a really fantastic story. We've layered up multiple lines of evidence and they've all come together to identify possible distal footprints of mineral systems. You know, we're able, fortunately, because of the historic mineral exploration that's taken place, we've been able to test those predictions um, and verify them using legacy drilling. And so what that gives us confidence for in this area is that not all of the positives are false. Um, undoubtedly, you're going to have some false positives, but by integrating a range of data sets, you're able to, I suppose, get a, a, a stronger confidence that what you're looking at is potentially the expression of a mineral system. So this is great news. So at this stage, we've developed a range of tools using, using these clo more closely spaced geophysical techniques to reduce the scale down uh, to our potential haystacks. So by this stage, we thought that the East Tenant region was shaping up as a potentially new exploration frontier. But did anyone really care? Um, is anyone paying attention to this? Well, this is a, a map of exploration tenements um, from a couple of years ago. And the exploration tenements are shown in these, uh, these polygons here, which have the hatch pattern. And you can see that there's some active mineral exploration. There's a lot around Tenant Creek, but in this East Tenant project area, which is shown by the red box here, um, you know, there's areas that are wide open spaces for mineral exploration. And so it wasn't really on a lot of people's radar. So we took our thinking to industry and we presented a workshop at NT Resources Week around about this time last year, where we outlined a number of the data sets and interpretations that we've been looking at um, so far. And uh, they listened. So the map here on the right shows uh, the same area with exploration tenements current as of right now, so downloaded just last week. And you can see that there's clearly a massive increase in the area that people are looking at. So people think that it's it's worthwhile looking in. In fact, it corresponds to a band about if we just take in that red box through there, there's there's more tenements taken up outside of that box, but it's a 181% increase in the area under tenement. So it's an extra roughly 11 and a half thousand square kilometers. So yeah, I guess people were interested. But the thing is, we're not interested in being salesmen. We're not interested necessarily in just attracting people in to take up tenements so we can make make maps like this. That's a great measure for us. Um, and, it, and it is the kind of uh, activity that we want to be able to stimulate. But if you think back to that vision from the onshore energy minerals division from when I first joined this place, what we want to do isn't attract people to take up tenements. Well, we do want to do that, but that's not where we, where we want to stop. We want to help people to discover a new mineral province and the emphasis is on discovery. And to do that, I think you need two things. You need to have a regional geological framework um, so that you know the different geological ingredients you have to play with um, to, to try and predict what mineralization you might have and where it might be. So it's a framework that you can target your exploration within. And I think you want evidence uh, of mineral systems so that you know what kind of deposit styles are in the mix. And you also know that you, you know, you're not just searching in an area hoping for the best. There is something worthwhile to look for. 
And to do these things, you need real rocks. And that brings us to step three. To make a real difference, you need real rocks. And this is very uh, dear to my heart as a geologist. So how can we go about understanding the geology undercover? Um, here's a list of, of some of the main tools which are at our disposal. We can extrapolate from exposed geology. Uh, we can use historic drilling to get a clue about the geology undercover. And or we can interpret the signal from geophysical data to help map, map in bits of the geology undercover. So can we use outcropping the East Tenant area? Uh, the short answer is no. So the coloured polygons on this map, so areas in here, it's a little bit hard to see, sorry, but also up here and here. These are areas where we have the right age rocks to host mineralization that stick out of the ground. Um, but we've previously discussed how much of the area looks like this, i.e. it's covered and there's not a rock in sight. And this map basically tells that same story. There's barely any exposed rocks in the East Tenant area. Where they are exposed, they're not the right age. So unfortunately, extrapolating from known outcrops isn't going to help us very much in mapping the geology of the East Tenon area. But what about drill holes? Well, like I said, there is, uh, there has been a bit of mineral exploration effort in this area to date, not a whole lot, but there are some drill holes that come out of that that we can play around with. And this map shows where those drill holes are. So the, um, the solid light green circles here, are drill holes which intersect basement rocks of the right age. And the open circles are, are other drill holes that maybe didn't quite get to uh, intersecting the prospective basement rocks. And yeah, we can get some idea of what's going on um, from these drill holes, but it's really only a, a handful of holes across a massive, massive area, several hundred kilometers. Um, we really don't have many constraints. So unfortunately, legacy drilling isn't going to help us very much. But what about geophysics? Maybe we can map in the geology for using magnetics and gravity and things like that. Um, well, to look at that, we're going to first look at this area around Tennant Creek. So Tennant Creek has a lot of exposed rocks at the surface. This is a, this is a, a surface geology map of that area. And what I've done is to simplify that surface geology map into two main stratigraphic units. The Warramunga Formation shown in brown, and the Uridigi group shown in this kind of orangey color here. And these are really important stratigraphic units. Around Tennant Creek, most of the known mineralization is hosted in this, in this brown unit, this Warramunga formation, whereas Uridigi group overlies the Warramunga formation, it's younger in age, and it doesn't host very much in the way of mineralization. So clearly mapping out Warramunga formation is of really uh, primary importance to us. So how do they look geophysically? What I've done here is to plot those, um, those same units over the top of the magnetics and gravity data uh, for the region. And unfortunately, these two units don't have distinctive geophysical properties. So in magnetics, they look very, very much the same. In gravity data, even though the data in here is quite good, where it's not of a suitable scale to be able to resolve um, these different stratigraphic units. And like I said, it's really important to be able to map out one unit versus the other for mineral exploration purposes. So even in an area where we have good outcrop control, we can't easily make sense of the geophysical patterns. So if we step out to the East Tannin area where we have, uh, like we've been talking about, very few um, constraints on the geology, it's not looking good. So it sounds like three strikes and we're out. Well, maybe not quite. Uh, so Geoscience Australia has partnered with the MINEX CRC to help in mapping the, the geology of the East Tenant region. So the MINEX CRC is a cooperative research centre that's really looking at this challenge that we've been talking about the whole way along of trying to unlock the mineral potential undercover and to lead to the next wave of mineral discoveries. So for those unfamiliar with it, it's the world's largest mineral exploration research collaboration. It's worth a huge amount of money, $220 million. There's 29 participants. It's a 10 year program. So really long term, we're a couple of years into that. And it has three research programs. The first around developing more efficient drilling technologies. The second around developing tools to collect and interrogate data while drilling uh, to inform decisions 
uh, made in near real time, which is really cool. And the third is to deploy the new technologies as part of a national drilling initiative or NDI. Um, a number of you would be familiar with the International Ocean Drilling Program, which is uh, uh, involved in trying to get constraints on the geology in offshore basins around the world. But this is kind of like the onshore equivalent of that. And the aim of the NDI is to open up new mineral provinces. So what we've been talking about all along. And the very first NDI campaign off the ranks is the East Tenant Project. So the East Tenant NDI campaign um, consists of drilling a number of drill holes. So uh, I've shown the location of our planned holes in, in this map here. There's 10 of them that are planned. Now, whether or not we get to drill all of those because of operational reasons and logistics and things like that, wet seasons, etc., cetera, um, remains to be seen. But this is what we hope to achieve. And these holes are aimed at trying to put some geological meat on the geophysical bones, so providing geological constraints on geophysical objects. Um, we want to test some of our predictions, the kind of things we were looking at earlier. And each one of these holes has a very particular aim that it's, it's trying to address. But there's a couple of overarching themes. Firstly, we want to understand the regional geological framework. We want to know what the stratigraphy is, what those rocks are, how old they are, how they got to be there, what the structures are when they moved, things like that. And we also want to identify evidence for the presence of mineral systems. So testing some of these interesting looking um, scale reduction features, which, which we've been examining in previous slides. And these two overarching aims correspond to uh, what we talked about earlier as being what explorers need to explore and discover in the East Tenant area. So I'm pleased to say that drilling as part of the East Tenant NDI campaign kicked off uh, really recently, in fact, last month, it's been going for about a month now. And this is some of the photos from, from drilling operations. It's a pretty uh, spectacular landscape and drill rigs are really cool. They're big and they're noisy and they get rocks out of the ground for us, which is uh, what we're really after. And these are some of the first results to come out from it. So this is one of the drill holes we've drilled to date and the detail in there isn't really important. But what I want to do is show you some rocks that we've gotten out of this program. So we've drilled through the cover sequences. Um, in this case, we've drilled it with um, reverse circulation drilling. So we've got drill chips out and these are um, carbonate rocks of the Georgina Basin. Then um, this is where I guess the magic really happens for us. So right here, right at this point here is where you go from the overlying cover rocks down into the prospective Paleoproterozoic basement. In this case, it's um, some kind of felsic intrusive igneous rock. And this is so cool. This is so exciting, I think, because this is the first time in over 500 million years that these rocks have seen the light of day. It's the first time that they've ever been seen with human eyes. And they're going to provide us a lot of useful information as to nature and the characteristics of these basement rocks. So it's really cool. And we've drilled um, substantial basement tails to give us plenty of material to play with. Some cases, the lithology changes down the hole. In this particular hole, it's it's gone into more of a metasedimentary unit, which has got some, um, some intrusives that have gone into it. So there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff to play with, a lot of different events captured, even in this just one drill hole. And what we want to do is to tear it apart to extract the most geological information that we can possibly get. So just looking at this hole, we can do things around characterizing the cover. How thick is it? What are its geophysical properties? Um, we can try and understand the potential for phosphate resources within those cover sequences, which are important. Once we get into basement, we can get a number of ages out of it to try and figure out when it got there and what it's been through since. So igneous crystallization ages, deformation ages, maximum depositional ages on the sediments. Um, we can piece together the thermal history and the uplift history. We can measure structures. We can try and find out about the composition of these rocks geochemically. And we can look at those sediments to try and understand the depositional environment and relate that to a possible setting that those rocks were deposited in. So even from this just one hole, a huge amount of information, which is going to be valuable for us piecing together that regional geological framework. So as a result of this drilling, which like I said, is still ongoing, but what we're able to do 
is really tick off a bunch of those um, those wish list items for mapping geology undercover. By drilling these holes, what we're in effect doing is making new outcrops, new geological constraints. And we're doing that by adding new boreholes. Um, but the important thing is we're not just drilling random holes and getting a piece of information in a very restricted area. We're trying to characterize really broad geophysical features. So the reason we're doing that is because we want to extrapolate our understanding from these, these point understandings and these drill holes to a much broader area. So we're characterizing the geophysical signal, uh, geophysical signature to aid in better interpretation. So let's go back to our three-step process. So what we've done is we've identified the fairway so far, we've developed tools to reduce the scale, and finally, we've seen how real rocks acquired in the area contribute to making a real difference. So let's wrap these things up now. At the beginning of this talk, we discussed how we need to search for the needle in the haystack to find new deposits. But actually, as it turns out, we need to first know where the haystack is that we need to look for the needle in. And even more fundamentally, we need to know that we're in the right ballpark or in the right kind of field where we could expect the haystacks to be. And we took a whole bunch of data, including new data acquired during EFTF, as well as existing data. And these data sets give us, in a sense, fresh eyes or, or new ways of looking at the potential of these areas. And we chucked them in our blender and we smashed them all up. And so what have we found? Well, using the big picture data sets, we've been able to identify the right kind of field to look in, which is the East Tenant Fairway. Then, using infill geophysics and other high resolution studies, we've identified the locations of possible haystacks within this corridor. And then, finally, by getting real rocks, um, we can start to get a better idea of what the needle we're searching for might look like and to help to pinpoint where the most likely haystacks are to find it in. So, I think we've set out what we've been trying to achieve. Um, we've, we've potentially identified a new prospective province undercover, and now really it's up to mineral explorers in this region to go out there and find the actual needle itself. That's, that's um, the role for industry. Our role is to kind of provide that baseline of work to inform the prospectivity of the area. Now, as with any large piece of work, which has been conducted over several years, there's a number of key learnings that, that fall out of this. And I've just listed some of the key lessons, I think, from this story for me. And the first one of those is that in order to go big, you need to go small. So what I mean by that is if you're just trying to straight away go in greenfields covered areas, trying to find the needle, um, you're kind of going to miss the forest for the trees. So we needed to start at that really broad scale, acquire those broad data sets to zoom in and focus our efforts. Um, we also saw that data integration is key. So integrating across different scales, importantly integrating across a number of disciplines. Um, so bringing a whole bunch of techniques into the mix and importantly, integration between geology and geophysics. So the geology needs to make sense of the geophysics and the geophysics is used to extrapolate out the ge those geological understandings. And to do that, we need real rocks. But they say that it's the friends you make along the way that's really important. Well, in this case, it's maybe not so much about the friends, although there's some of those, but there is also an undeniable human side of this that's also really important. And I think there's some key lessons that come out of that as well. And the first of those is that multidisciplinary teams are the best teams. You know, in this bit of work, there's not many parts of the mineral systems branch here at GA that don't have their fingerprints all over this. Um, it wouldn't have been possible without bringing a whole range of techniques into the mix. So pretty much any geo discipline you can, you can think of was really critical for us. Because you've got so many people from so many different backgrounds, it's really important to bring people along for the journey. So, um, the, the best results are achieved where people are uh, invested in the project, they've brought into it, they know what they're doing, they know the contribution they're making, rather than just being treated necessarily as something like a service provider. And the final point there is that although smart people are really great, what's actually really valuable is having team culture. So people who want to do the best in this area, they're invested, they're asking, they're intellectually curious, they want to drive 
good results and good outcomes. So where to next? Well, before, at the start of this talk, I talked about um, phase one of Exploring for the Future. The great news is that it, the Exploring for the Future program has now been expanded for another four years, so taking us up to 2024. And this time we have $125 million to play with, and that's to extend the approach that we've taken uh, in the first phase of EFTF across the entire continent. So before we focused in Northern Australia, now we're rolling it out Australia-wide. And so the question is, if we follow this approach, how many more East tenants are there? And I would suggest that if we follow a logical um, approach, the kind which we've stepped through in this presentation, acquire the right data sets, ask the right questions of those data sets, then many more East tenants will fall out and hopefully lead us to um, more discoveries into the future. So that's everything I have. I've spoken for a really long time. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Um, I'm really excited to present this work because we're really at the pointy end of several years worth of work and the results that are going to be coming out soon are going to hopefully be really exciting. There's a lot of information on the project that I haven't gone into. If you're interested in it, there's a couple of web links there and I would encourage you to go and have a look at that. But I might just leave that there and thank you everybody for listening. Ah, congratulations, Anthony. That was a fantastic uh, PowerPoint slides presentation. Very enthusiastic and just amazing what the team have achieved in a few short years. Uh, what an audacious goal to even have. Um, and here we are at the, um, the pointy end, if you like, the drilling. Um, we have a lot of questions, but we don't have a lot of time. Sorry. So I'll start with, what, no, no, that's all good. We've got one from Jared. What downhole geophysical logging techniques are being used at the moment? Yep, so um, like I said, one of the, the aims that we have for this drilling program is to be able to extrapolate our understanding um, to a broader area. And so to do that, we're trying to calibrate um, I guess the geophysical signatures. So we're doing a full suite of downhole wireline logs. Um, so we're doing MAGSAS, density, um, gamma, conductivity, which is really important because conductivity has been a big part of the story. Um, there's a few other things, but uh, there's, a, there's a comprehensive suite of downhole geophysical logs, which will be done on all these holes. Um, and that data will be released. Um, actually, I won't make any promises about that, yeah. but it will, it will be released. <laughs> Thank you. The next one I'll take from Steve. He says, so besides taking up real estate, what are the activities that companies are now doing in these tenement areas? Uh, is it after all that activity that we'll make the discovery um, rather than leaving it just up to industry to take a, a stand on the shoulders of giants, that's you, uh, do you have any comment on what industry can now do to better find the needle? Oh, interesting. Well, I think so industry is active in the area. I mean, I guess um, the a lot of those tenements were only taken up quite recently, so we're yet to see um, the fruits of all that um, that new exploration yet. But I think the scale reduction thing is really key. Uh, what we've done is to identify some some patches that are still quite broad, really, if you think about them, that are more prospective than others. I think probably the next phase of infill in those areas uh, will be really informative. So taking some of the similar techniques that we've been applying, but um, higher resolution studies to try and pinpoint where those needles are, I think that's going to be uh, that's going to be really critical. And I know already some explorers in the area have done things like gravity infill, which is great to see. I hope that yep. Um, Ollie asks about data. Uh, what are the challenges of finding, accessing, cleaning and processing data sets? And if there was any challenges, uh, what would have made it easier to help interrogate that data? Oh my gosh, so many challenges. Um, well, I mean, I guess a lot of the data sets which we've been using are new, fresh ones from Exploring for the Future. Um, but we did do quite a large process of trying to capture legacy drill hole information. Um, and that was so we could get the best geological understandings we possibly could out of the area and also use them to inform, um, you know, ideas about depth to basement and things like that. I think we're taking the right steps uh, in legacy data capture, so building databases to, to house this kind of information. Um, so things like the, the boreholes database that GA is developing, 
Um, I think, you know, things like the eggs database to capture depth to basement estimates, those are really important databases. And I guess it's up to us now to, in the course of the work that we do in these areas to capture the legacy data that occur within them and populate those databases. So it's, it's, it's in a clean format and that data is reusable and repurposable uh, for a range of applications. Um, yep. I mean, I guess there's some things you can do with like trying to be a bit more smart about how you capture that information uh, and automate it, but uh, that's kind of outside of my realm of expertise. Yep, very good summary. On that note, I'd like to thank you again, Anthony. Congratulations on your DGAL. Um, and um, uh, there's been a lot of um, positive um, feedback in the chat. I hope you catch some of that. Um, I'd like to let you know ne next week we will welcome Drs. Tanya Lobstein and Tan Taryn Lobstein and Tanya O'Donnell from Future Earth Australia, who will be presenting on that organisation's implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals in Australia, collaborations with GA, including a 10-year strategy on sustainable oceans and coasts, and opportunities for early career researchers and practitioners. We hope you were able to join us again then, and thank you for joining us today. Have a good afternoon.